Happy Mother's Day. Welcome you to our services. Hilltop Baptist Church, Chula Vista, California. It's May 10th, 2020, and uh, hopefully all your mothers are having a great day today. Uh, perhaps your family's made you breakfast or given you cards and flowers and done things for you. Um, we also are concerned for our moms uh, who maybe haven't been able to be moms, that uh, would desire to be moms, but they've been adoptive moms. They've helped other moms and, and stepped up and done some things. So we're grateful for all of you that are mothers, and all of us that have mothers are very grateful as well. I want to sing a song this morning, so we're going to sing, He Keeps Me Singing. He has put a new song in my mouth. within my heart a melody Jesus whispers sweet and low fear not I am with you peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow Jesus 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 sweetest name I know wrecked by sin and strife, discord filled my heart with pain, Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again, Jesus, 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 sweet Since it's Mother's Day today, we want to talk about our moms. In Proverbs 31, there are some great verses about the virtuous woman. And it says in verses 28 and 29 that her children rise up and call her blessed. And the heart of her husband does safely trust in her. And we're thankful for mothers whose price is far above rubies, as it's told in Proverbs 31. And so I thought I would share to you what somebody has penned 
called Beatitudes for Mothers. Beatitudes for Mothers. Blessed are the mothers who love God, for their children shall not be ignorant of their Creator and His plans concerning them. Blessed are the mothers who love the Word of God, for their children shall know of the way, the truth, and the life. Blessed are the mothers who love the house of God, for their children shall enter there and sit with them in the presence of God. Blessed are the mothers who love to pray, for their children shall feel the power of prayer and many shall find salvation. Blessed are the mothers who love to give to the cause of Christ, for their children shall become supporters of the kingdom of God. Blessed are the mothers who love the family altar, for they shall have their reward in this world and in the world to come. Blessed are the mothers who love to speak kind words to their neighbor's children, for thereby they shall win other boys and girls besides their own to Jesus Christ. Blessed are the mothers who love to be companions to their children, for they shall be called understanding mothers. Blessed are the mothers who love to fight life's battles, bravely with a strong and steadfast faith in God, for their children shall know where to find strength in the time of need. Blessed are the mothers who, when they are old and gray, can look back upon memory's wall with no regret and can say, I brought my children up in the fear of the Lord. Theirs are the mansions in glory. I am very grateful for the mothers that I know. I'm thankful for my mom who invested so much time and energy in helping me be raised and discipled as a little boy. The sacrifices that she made. And I jokingly say things about my mom, but I love her very deeply. And I was able to spend some time with her this past week. I went up and got her some Olive Garden for lunch, and then we went and got some ice cream from Brewster's a little later. And so it was great to spend time with my mom for Mother's Day. And I'm thankful for my wife. I think my wife is a great illustration of a godly woman who is a great mom. Uh, she has worked to help disciple our daughters, to raise them in what it means to be a homemaker and a mother. I'm grateful for her mom, Marge Long, that invested many years in helping Darcy know how to be a great mom. And I know a lot of mothers in our church who are great moms, who work hard for their kids, or great grandmothers, and even some who have not been able to be mothers but are willing to step in and adopt and foster and to spend time helping people. I I appreciate women who have a mother's heart, whether they have their own children or not, who, who reach out to mothers, mother others. I'm grateful and appreciative of that. And in a moment, I'm going to pray for our moms. Uh, I posted a video recently on our Facebook page uh, that talked about sometimes moms, especially in this day and age, need quarantine too. I just thought it was sort of cute, sort of funny. Um, but uh, we appreciate our moms and all they're willing to do to sacrifice uh, for their children. I want to talk about answers to prayer and praise the Lord's today. Um, if you have a bulletin that has prayer sheet in it, we won't go over all the prayer sheet, all the prayer things, all the answers to prayer. Um, but in speaking to people this week, um, uh, people are doing much better. Uh, uh, Lowell, who is Jerry's grandson, uh, our nephew, pardon me, uh, is doing much better. They are doing some testing on him. And uh, we're thankful for that. And Don's dad, Donnie's dad, Don, uh, as far as I know, is out of the hospital doing better. And we prayed for Gladys, and Gladys is doing better. And uh, Susan and Frank said to, that they are blessed that their family is going to have another baby. Uh, I think it's a great nephew, great niece. And uh, Debbie said that Andrew is safe from COVID-19, and so we're thankful for that. And we're thankful for everything that God has blessed us with. Um, 
We also are praying today for Michael. Uh, Michael is in my Sunday school class and he asked for prayer. He's having problems uh, physically. We're also praying for the Native Americans uh, that are on the reservations that are facing issues um, with lack of medical care and the coronavirus has taken uh, many lives there. Uh, we pray also for um, Armando, that God will be with him and help him, and for Ziggy and Richard and for Tina's mom. We pray for those that are without work. And we pray for those whose families are going through a difficult time because of pressures that are mounting. Um, we pray for those in our community that are suffering domestic abuse or child abuse. We pray for them because of this quarantine and all the pressures and financial issues. We just pray for them. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer today to pray for these things. Dear Heavenly Father, we come humbly before you today. We are grateful for the blessings that you give us. Lord, as we have been on the phone and talked to people and communicated back and forth, we're so glad that Don's dad did not have COVID-19 and that he was taken care of safely uh, with his issues and able to return home. We're thankful that Gladys is doing better. We're thankful that Andrew is safe from COVID-19. We're thankful for new life being brought into this world for Susan and Frank's family and a new baby coming there. Uh, we're thankful for how you've been with us as a church and you've protected us and you've given us a blessing. Uh, we pray for those, Lord, who are struggling uh, in our community. Uh, as you've blessed them and kept them safe, there's many people that do not have COVID-19, uh, but Lord, there are those that do. But there are some who are facing other pressures as well, and so we pray for them for financial situations and for uh, situations of health, other issues, Lord, that they might have heart conditions or high blood pressure or diabetes. Uh, we pray, Lord, for our first responders, our nurses and our doctors and the medical people that are working so hard to help this uh, terrible thing to stop. Uh, we pray that you'll be with them. Uh, we pray for Michael with a physical issue. We pray for the Native Americans and the reservations that are being hit hard with COVID-19, as, as well as people around the nation and around the world. And we pray for Michelle. We pray for Bob. We pray for Gary. We pray for Maurice and for Armando. And we pray, Lord, for those who are suffering in our community from domestic abuse, uh, domestic situations. And we pray for those who are suffering through uh, problems in their home with their kids. Lord, just I ask that you might be with the leadership uh, of our uh, system in our government as they make decisions, Lord, that uh, they can make good decisions and that we'll be safe, but yet we can see some ends to these. Be with those who are in the police department and the sheriff's department and uh, law enforcement as they deal with things that you might give them a blessing today as well, Lord, and have your hand upon them and keep them safe. And we pray for our president for our governor, for our mayor, for our county supervisors, that you might help them to make the right decisions uh, and have your hand upon them at this time. Uh, we pray for those who have lost jobs, that you might give them work. And we pray for spiritual needs. We pray for the lost, that they'll come to salvation. They'll come to know Jesus Christ. I pray for someone out there, Lord, who is at this time, at a very scary time, being drawn to you that they can find a Bible, they can find a, a message from a church being spoken or a video where they can be introduced to Jesus Christ. And Lord, draw people to you. We are your creation. We belong to you. And it is your will to do as you will. But we pray for people's eternal position that they might know you as Savior. I ask that you might bless our moms and help them. Some who are working double duty, trying to do a job from an office at home, and also taking care of their family. Lord, that you might be with them and bless them. Some who have not been able to see their kids, either through the phone or through a video message. Lord, I pray that you might help them to cope with the day. Thank you for mothers. Thank you, Lord, for creating woman in the way that you did to be a great mother uh, to uh, children and to help meet uh, for Adam and that we can partner together uh, as men and women to raise children and to be a home. Lord, I thank you for that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will remember to contact me 
uh, through text message or email or phone call here to the church or as I call around and let me know what your prayer request is or answer to prayer so that we can list them on our prayer sheet and give thanks to God who gives us answered prayer and bring our request humbly before his throne of grace. And it says that we have every right to go boldly before the Father with our prayer requests and ask him for those things. And so if you'll communicate, uh, some of you, I, I, I try to call you and I'm not getting any messages or any answers back from you. So I'm just checking on you to see how you're feeling and how you're doing. Today's message is continuing about faith over fear. And today in our message, uh, we're going to talk about unexpected change. Unexpected change. Some people love unexpected change. Uh, because it means something new and something fresh and, and something different. But uh, as I get older, I'm finding that I don't really like unexpected change. I don't know about you. Um, I, 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 there are some who, if any kind of change comes into their lives, they get very worried. They get very fearful. And my question to you today is, do you fear unexpected change? Change is going to happen. Some of it is planned and some of it is not. But what happens when unexpected change comes? Over the past couple of months, uh, this unexpected change in our lives has caused a lot of reactions from people. From anger, to disbelief, to disconnect. But how should we as Christians respond? Through faith in God to unexpected change. How should we respond? Should we be fearful or should we say, Lord, here's my issue, here's my problem, I want to hand this to you and allow you to take care of it? What do we do with unexpected change? Do we just try to hide and cover up and pretend nothing's going to ever change? Uh, This past week, uh, I'm on a uh, Facebook page and a group with people that went to the same high school I went to. Uh, It wasn't a very large high school. I, I don't know how many were there at its peak. Um, but I have been scanning yearbooks and posting them on that Facebook group. And I, I, I'm looking at the reactions of people that are my age or a little older, and it, it, it gets to be that we're very nostalgic. We think back to those days and think back, well, that was a great time of life, and, and we forget all the, the tough things that happened, all the, all the things that happened at school and were happening in our lives. And we're talking in the early 70s. A lot of things are going on in America, and I can't imagine. I was in seventh grade in 1974. I can't imagine being uh, a senior in 1974 and possibly facing the fear of being drafted to go into the military to be in Vietnam. I, I just, uh, but it, we, so we look back at things, and, and we, 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 we don't remember the changes, but we look back with nostalgia and think, oh, that was a great time. But let's face it, we have been through changes, some of them planned, and then some of them very unexpected. We're going to look at the story of a woman today who becomes the most famous mother this world has ever had. We're going to look at the story of Mary and how she responded through faith to unexpected change in her life. The story is found in the book of Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. So if you have a Bible... If you'd like to turn there and look at those uh, verses, uh, you can follow along on the screens as I read through these verses. But Mary, as a young woman, some have said maybe as young as 13 or 14, she's living in a town called Nazareth, which is a very uh, cosmopolitan town for that time period. Uh, It's Jewish, it's in Galilee, it's to the west of the Sea of Galilee, but there is a Roman garrison schedule. uh, stationed there and uh, she's there in that town and uh, she is betrothed to Joseph who was an established carpenter. History and tradition tells us that typically the man would be a little older and established in the community and the marriage would be made by uh, would be set up by a matchmaker and so uh, we don't know about the love between Joseph and Mary we are not told about their great love story but she is betrothed. It's, it's more than an engagement. It's, it's like they're married, but they're not actually living together. They're not sleeping together. That um, Mary would come and take ho- care of his house and, and cook and do things like that, but she wouldn't spend the night. 
And so they are in a very tight relationship, but she's very young, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden something happens. Something happens in her life. And we're going to read from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. So if you'll follow along with me as we read this passage today. It's very familiar if you know the Christmas story. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin. I want to emphasize the Bible clearly states this is not a young woman or a maiden This is a virgin. These young ladies, as they were waiting for marriage, they knew the Old Testament law that said that you needed to wait and have relations with your husband after you were married. Not in the situation that we're in today where it it seems like people don't seem to care about those things anymore, but she is definitely a virgin. She has not had sexual relations with anyone. The angel comes. He's sent by God to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. It's interesting. There's like three responses here as Mary is dealing with this angel. And the angel comes in and he doesn't say fear not at the beginning. He just says rejoice. Highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But she's troubled at what he says and is just sort of wondering what kind of greeting this angel is bringing. What what does this all mean? (laughs) Well, it's going to mean change. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You have been marked as a spiritual individual. God has seen your life, and He's going to honor your life, and He's going to do something for you. In fulfillment of prophecy from Isaiah that says, The virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. The angel announces, you are going to give birth to a man named Jesus, to a baby, to a child, to an individual named Jesus, and he is going to be the son of the highest. He's going to be God's son. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? Now the angel says, you're going to be pregnant, you're going to conceive, you're going to have a child, and this is what's going to happen. And Mary is sort of thinking nuts and bolts here. Uh, She's thinking uh, very common sense, and she goes, wait a minute, whoa, stop. I know what has to happen for a woman to get pregnant. She, She grew up in an agrarian society where she saw what had to happen for an animal to become pregnant. or She knew what had to happen between a man and a woman for her to become pregnant. She goes, hold on a minute. How is this all going to happen? Since I don't know a man, and that's a nice way of phrasing that says, uh, I've not had sex with anybody. I I haven't had sex previous to this. I haven't had sex with my one that I'm betrothed to. How, How can this possibly, how can I be pregnant? There's a lot of commentary on this, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this today. But there are those that say, well, it was a Roman soldier that she had sex with, and that's how she got pregnant. That's not what the Bible says. And there are others that say, well, you know, they're betrothed, so they probably slept together. I mean, the passion was there and the love was there, and they just went ahead and did it. Uh, That's not what the Bible says, and I believe the Bible to be absolute truth. So I'm going to believe what the Bible has to say about it. How is this going to happen? I I don't understand. I've not had sex with anybody. I've not known a man. How how is this going to happen that I'm going to be pregnant? And the angel answered and said to her, 
The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Let me just speak to this for a second. If God can create everything out of nothing, as we're told in the book of Genesis, chapters 1, 2, and 3, if He can create everything from nothing, then He can take and plant a seed in the womb of of a woman who's never had relations and cause her to be pregnant to give birth to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Even today, medical technology has advanced to that point where they can harvest an egg from a woman, they can fertilize that egg in a Petri dish, and then they can place the egg back into the woman as a fertilized cell that will, then she will become pregnant. But we should not say, this couldn't happen this way. The angel goes on to explain a miracle that's happened. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. So the angel's helping her understand what's happening and what's going to happen. He says, uh, you, you have a trouble understanding this whole pregnancy thing and, and giving birth to Jesus, um, your cousin who has been barren as a wife, never had a child, she's conceived a child in her old age. And she's six months pregnant. And then he makes this phrase, and, and this is a great phrase for you to underline and hang on to, for with God, nothing will be impossible. There's a lot of things that people say and, and they dream about and somebody comes along and says, that's impossible, you can't do that. The Bible tells us, with God, nothing will be impossible. And then we see the third reaction that Mary gives. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So she says, I'm okay. I'm the servant of the Lord. Whatever he wants to have happen is fine with me. I'll, take, I'll, I'll, I'll obey it, I'll do it, I accept it. And the angel departed from her. And if you read on into chapter 1 of the book of Luke, and you see her reaction, you see the words that she speaks and prays to God for what God is doing in her life. And this from a young woman, 13, 14, 15 years of age, that's not even married, and has all of a sudden this unexpected change happen to her overnight. Overnight, One day, she's betrothed to Joseph, and everything seems to be going along swimmingly and smoothly. And then all of a sudden, the angel appears and says, Oh, by the way, you're going to be pregnant, and you're going to have a son. His name is Jesus, and he's going to be the Son of God. You can read in Matthew chapter 1 the reaction of Joseph to the whole thing and what God does in that situation. And eventually, Joseph and Mary marry. They get married, and then Joseph and Mary have to travel to Bethlehem where she gives birth, that's in Luke chapter 2. But it was a tremendously unexpected change. So how did she deal with unexpected change in her life through faith in God? Well, unexpected change didn't bother her because she was fully committed to living a godly life. Do you remember when you were reading back there a minute ago when we were following along and we were reading through there and it talked about the situation and he says you are a highly favored one the Lord is with you blessed are you among women and he says you have found favor with God she's chosen to live a godly life and she's been committed to it while others might have been doing things they shouldn't do according to the Old Testament law according to what God command was She's chosen to live for God. She's chosen to be a follower. And so we believe her family was observing the commandments and observing the sacrifices and the festivals of the spiritual things that God wanted. And when the angel comes and speaks to her, she's ready because she's fully committed to living a godly life. If you're living a godly life, you're ready when unexpected change comes. A couple of weeks ago, 
I received notification that a missionary, I, I believe he and his wife had come to our church in Las Vegas. His name was Randy Roberts, or Randall Roberts. I, I don't remember how I met him, but he came as a missionary to our church in Las Vegas, and I don't remember if he came here to Hilltop or not, he and his wife, a really big guy. But he had some medical issues, and I remember seeing some of that, and then a couple of weeks ago, I saw that he'd passed away. Some of you have been following Rabbi Zacharias. He is a apologist for Christianity, and there's a, sort of an unexpected change in his life because of uh, the cancer in his back and in his spine. And they say that he's in his last me- weeks, if not months. How do people stand unexpected change? Through faith. Because they're already living godly lives. And they're committed to that. And they're willing to say, whatever happens, happens. Jesus said, if you wanted to be his disciple, that you would take up your cross and follow him. But Psalm 1 has this to say about the person who is committed to being a Christ follower, who is committed to living a godly life. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. That's someone who is committed to serving God, to living for God. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. That's someone who's committed to living the godly life, and he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose roots grow deep and can stand the changes of life even if they're unexpected. How about you? How about you? Are you living a godly life? Are you committed to that? No matter what happens? No matter what happens? David says this in Psalm 119. Your testimonies, your word, I have taken as a heritage forever. For they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes, your laws, your commandments forever to the very end. Are we committed to living a godly life? No matter what happens. I haven't said this in a long time. The true test of your belief in Jesus Christ, of your Christianity, is what you do when you think no one else is watching. How you act when you're out at work or at play or at school. That's the true test. Are you living for Jesus then? Or when unexpected change comes, how do you respond? We see these words in Romans 13, verses 11 through 14. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. If we will put on the armor of God and will wake up and will live the godly life, then when unexpected change comes, it doesn't bother us. We just go on. We just go on. Because we're trusting in God. Uh, we, we have our life committed to whatever He wants to do. I've taken up the cross. That means whatever happens, happens. Unexpected change shouldn't bother me. Well, we also see that unexpected change didn't bother Mary because she believed the promises that were in God's Word. She believed the promises that were in God's word. Well, how how do you get that, Pastor Walt? Well, uh, the angel says, you're highly honored and you're going to conceive and and you found favor in the sight of God. And she said, well, how can this be, seeing I've not known a man? Well, she's living by 
what God's word had to say. And she's following his commandments and she believed in the promises that it basically says this, if you obey him, if you obey God, he'll bless you. If you don't obey God, if you disobey God, if you totally ignore what God has to say, then you are going to receive his judgment. And so she wouldn't be open to receiving this blessing unless she had already believed in the promises that were in God's word. Let's look at some of those promises. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 5. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, And heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. Look at Psalm 23, and what it says about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God has established my steps. I believe she believed in these promises. God is establishing her steps in her life. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order if I would declare and speak of them. They are more than can be numbered. I can remember in Bible college, as we were studying these passages, and I believe my father may have said it as well, as he taught through this, that it was a lot of young ladies' desires that were living in Israel and Galilee and Judea in those times, a lot of young ladies' desires to be the one who would give birth to the Messiah, that they were sort of hoping to be that one, that they they relished that and they were hoping for that and so they were living for that because if Mary had had sexual relations with Joseph or with somebody else before this point, then Mary wouldn't have been the the mother of Jesus Christ. It says that she was a virgin. It says in Isaiah 7, 14, A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. She has to be a virgin. So she kept the promises, and she believed in those promises. Do you believe in the promises of God? Do you believe that he's established your steps? Look at Jeremiah 21, verses 11 through 13. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope that you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Look at that first part. God's thoughts that he's thinking toward us. Now, here in Jeremiah, this is at a time when the people have been told they're going to be in exile because they've not been living the the life that God called him to live. But he says in the earlier parts of this chapter in Jeremiah, he says, I'm aware of what's going on. I'm aware that you're in exile. I'm aware that you weren't following me and listening to me and obeying me and worshiping me. But he goes, I know the thoughts. And he goes, I don't want to just give you evil. I want to bring you peace. I want to bring you a future and a hope. In the Word of God, when it talks about Jesus Christ, you see that He's despised and rejected of men. You see that on Isaiah 53. You see that in Psalm 22. You see that Jesus is sort of rejected by the Jews. And there are a lot that have put uh, stigma on the Jewish race because they rejected Jesus Christ. I'll just tell you this. There's a lot of people who are not Jewish that reject Jesus Christ. But Jesus, as he's on the cross, says, 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he's talking about the Jewish people. And even though God is working through the church today, and many Gentiles or non-Jews are believers in Jesus Christ, he wants Jews to be believers too. And we're told in the book of Revelation that he is going to have a great movement to bring the Jewish people to believe in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. To think that as much as we reject God or as they have rejected God, that Jesus is still interested because he has thoughts of peace and not of evil to give us a future and a hope. Folks, he's held off on his judgment a long time so that many people could come to salvation. He died to pay the price for all if all would believe. And Peter, we're told that he wants all to come to salvation. And this promise is something that Mary can hang on to. That this is not going to be a bad thing. Yeah, there are going to be some immediate issues that are going to come up because of this unexpected change. That she's going to have to go to Joseph and say, I'm pregnant. It's a miraculous thing. I didn't have sex with him because if he finds out that she's pregnant and not by him, she, he's... It says in Matthew, he was going to put her away privately until she gave birth. Maybe stop the whole marriage. And the Bible, the angel tells, and the Bible tells us in Matthew that the angel tells him, marry her, marry her, don't be afraid. But she would be stigmatized, she would be pushed off. And so she has to stand on this promise that God is thinking ahead and God knows everything. Do you believe that too? Back in Genesis chapter 3, God has created a perfect earth and the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve are enjoying life and then they sin and things happen. That was not a mistake that was planned. That was known by God. God knew that was going to happen. Jesus is coming to this earth and dying for us was not plan B. It was God's plan all along to show his love toward us. We have to be able to hang on to the, pr- the promises that are in God's Word. God does not intend just to give us uh, evil and, and terrible things, but He has thoughts of peace to give us a future and a hope. An unexpected change can do that. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. You remember how things started off in Philippi for Paul and Silas as they were beaten for throwing a demon out of a young lady and they were cast into prison? And they lay there at midnight, but they were worshiping God and praising God and things happened and the jailer got saved. And he says, I thank my God upon remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The one who has got a plan going is going to finish the plan. So this past week, we were doing some things at the house. Uh, Kelly has returned from college, uh, brought some things home, and we had put a large television set in her bedroom and made it our television secondary viewing room or game room if you will and she said dad do you think I possibly could get that television set moved out of my room I said yes I'll try to do that and so uh, I had to do some things I had to clean up some things out of another area and move them and then put the television out there so that we could prep it and so in the middle of that Darcy and I said hey, let's go look at something we might consider adding. Uh, We've enjoyed eating outside in our backyard uh, because it's cooler and uh, it's just pleasant there. And so we were maybe thinking about getting uh, some patio furniture, if you will, to have a table and chairs to sit at. And and so Darcy and I were out shopping and Darcy's like, well, it'd be nice to get this. And I said, the problem is, is everywhere we're going, there's lines. I don't want to wait a long time. We finally got into one place and they said, oh, we don't have that one in stock. And like, well, we can either go and try to find one or we can just do it later. And, and so just everything was going on. And I said, you know, I want to try to accomplish what I'd started. 
I need to get this, and I need to make sure that I get it over there and take care of it so I'm not messing with it any longer. I, I want to make it all happen. Because I like seeing things through. I don't like seeing things interrupted and I can't finish it. God has begun good things in us and He is going to complete it. He's not through working with you yet. He's not through. So Mary has chosen to be fully committed to serving God and she's believing in the promises of God. But unexpected change didn't bother her because she is willing to totally accept God's plan. She is willing to totally accept God's plan. What did she say at the very end in that last verse that we read back there? She said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Unexpected change shouldn't bother you because it's part of God's plan. Now, I'm not talking about you suffering because you've done something that is against God's, God's will, that is against God, and you're suffering the consequences of it. But that could be the discipline that you're receiving from God. But unexpected change shouldn't bother you. You should be okay with it because it's part of God's plan. I don't always know why God does things. I, I'm not in heaven yet, but God says this is going to happen and this is going to happen and this is going to happen. All the way back many, many years ago in the late 30s, early 40s, 1930s, 1940s, a group of men from a church in Portland, Maine, felt called of God to take the gospel to their surrounding communities. And they believed it was God's plan. And they were convicted by the Holy Spirit. And so they went out and they went into communities and they went to the little community that my dad and his family lived in. My dad was 13 years old approximately. And they go and they find a church, but no one has been attending. The building's all locked up and hasn't been cleaned and they find out who's got the keys and they go and they unlock it and they say hey to the community we're going to hold services on Sunday afternoons come out and hear and so my dad and his family went and my dad and his two brothers and my aunt and my grandma all received Jesus Christ and fast forward now almost almost a hundred years Almost a hundred years, and there are those that are serving God today. My brother and I both are serving God because of those men who believed in God's plan, that they would take those promises. Maybe one of these days when I get to heaven, I can find them and go up and shake their hand and say, thanks for taking the gospel to that little community so my dad can find Jesus and so I could find Jesus through my father. That was God's plan, and we need to accept it. Those guys may have wondered, well, I don't need to be going out to the community and doing this. I'm busy on Sunday. I don't want to go do that. But it was God's plan for Walt Hatch and Freeman Hatch and Harland Hatch and Connie Hatch and Elizabeth Hatch to find Jesus Christ and through that to affect lives. That's God's plan. Are we willing to accept it? Things have happened in my life to prove to me that God's got a plan that's good. And I need to be accepting of it. When God says something, it's unexpected change, but okay. Okay, I believe you, God. I'll do it. Psalm 139, verses 14 through 16 says this. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet they were none of them. In your book all my days were written the days were fashioned for me i don't know what the rest of 2020 holds for me what 2021 2022 I, I don't know what but 
things are going to happen, and I have to believe that God knows them, and God is aware of them, and it's part of his plan, and I should just say, hey, I'm accepting. I'll, t- I'll accept that. Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 12 God is speaking. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. <laughs> Our thoughts are for convenience and for ease and for return to normal. But look at where we're at now. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth with singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Do we understand that God's got it all in control? That God knows exactly what He's doing? 2 Timothy 1.12 says this, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him, to him until that day. I know whom I believed in, and I know that he is able to keep what I have committed to him. When I trusted in Jesus Christ and I said, I ask you to be my Savior and my Lord and come into my life, and I'm looking forward to you changing my life now and then taking care of me from eternity, I'm not to eternity yet but I have absolutely every belief that when I get to eternity, God's going to take care of me. When this life is over and I pass from this life to the next, that God's going to take care of me. I'm accepting of His will. I'm accepting of what He's doing to me. My question is, as Mary used her faith to help her when she faced unexpected change, Are you willing to allow your faith to help you when you face unexpected change? We never know what might happen next. We don't know. We would like to know. We would like to be able to be predict, uh, to predict things, to have a, a predictable life, but we don't. We face unexpected change. Psalm 118, verse 6, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Will you use your faith to help you when you face unexpected change? Are you willing to do these things as she did, that you will um, commit to living a godly life? Will you believe the promises that are in God's Word? And will you totally accept God's plan? And not fight it. I've been primarily speaking to those that are followers of Jesus Christ. But I also want to speak to you if you, are not, if you don't know who Jesus Christ is. I would love to share Jesus Christ with you. In a couple of minutes I'm going to post a couple of ways that you can contact us. And if you want to know more about salvation. What it means to believe in Jesus Christ. I'd be happy to share that with you. No pressure. Just something very simple that is easy to understand, the gift of salvation. And I would love to share that with you if you don't know who Jesus Christ is, but you'd like to have him help you when you face unexpected change. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you should not have any issue with unexpected change. You should be able to handle all of it. So that's my prayer for you today. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Unexpected change can come at any time in our lives. That's why it's unexpected. But Lord, as Mary responded with what she did, she had committed to serving you and she believed in your promises. And so she was willing to totally accept whatever you said. Lord, help us to be that same way when change comes. That we'll say, whatever God's will is, that's okay with me. I'm willing to accept it. I'm willing to take it into my life. And I'll be all right with that because I believe in God. I have faith in God. I have faith over fear. 
Lord, if there's anyone here that's been watching this today that doesn't know you, I pray that they might be open to finding out what a relationship with Jesus Christ looks like, what salvation looks like. And Lord, for those who may be struggling with this unexpected change and loss of job or health issues or whatever, that you might help them to have a full commitment to living for you, a full commitment to the promises that are contained in your word, and a full commitment to accepting the will of God in their lives. They won't fight it. They'll just say, God knows. He's planned it. It's in his plan. I pray for us that we might have faith over fear. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please contact us if you would like a Bible. I still have Bibles to give out. If you would like uh, something on paper of the studies that we've done or a digital copy, uh, I may post up on this the outline for the message. I appreciate Michi uh, putting the message up in the, in the notes on this video. Um, but you can contact me by phone here at the church or by email. Um, if you uh, will please share or like or pass along uh, the Facebook pages and uh, you can do it through YouTube. I'll have that posted pretty soon. And you also see Hilltop Baptist Church at freeonlinechurch.com. And if you will please let me know your praise and prayers. Be in prayer. Uh, I know that here in the state of California, there are several churches that are saying uh, if stores can start opening and other places that we might consider opening up again as a church. And so uh, I'm praying uh, along with Pastor Gutierrez and the leaders of his church and the leaders of our church that we can make the right decision about reopening and having church here once again. We want to keep people safe. We know that it's not going to return to what it was like in January or February, but it's going to be changed. And so uh, pray for us and pray for our church as we make those decisions. And please continue to send your offerings. God has blessed us. Uh, you can do it through our web page, through Tithely, or you can do it through mail, just sending it. We'll uh, send you an envelope if you so desire. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 31, verses 28 and 29, Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Thank you, moms, for all that you do. Thank you. Uh, we want to thank the Lord now, so let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, once again, for all the moms and all they do. And I would pray that you might be with them and you might have your hand upon them. And you might help them today to have a great day. Even though things have changed, they may not be able to see their family in person or give hugs. That, Lord, we can return to that point at some stage where we can be with our family members once again. Thank you for your blessings that you give us. Thank you for the word of God. Help us to have faith over fear. And I pray that you might be with each and every one that's either viewing this video or normally attends our church, that you might bless them this week, cause your face to shine upon them. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.